math with vectors. So we'll talk about vector addition and subtraction, and then we'll get into the more interesting topic of vector multiplication, where there's dot products and cross products. We'll see that dot products are all about projections, and cross products are all about area and calculating vectors that are perpendicular. We'll go through some vector algebra rules, and then very quickly we'll end with triple products. Let's visualize vector addition and subtraction. So let's say we would like to add two vectors, u and v. We start by drawing the vector u, then we draw the vector v extending from the tip of u in the direction of v. The vector sum is then the vector that connects the start of vector u to the end of vector v after we've stacked v onto u. So the green line here, that is the vector sum or vector addition. Let's now look at vector subtraction. And what we'll see is this is almost the same thing as vector addition. So first we write the vector u, but now since we're doing a subtraction, it's kind of like we add on top of this negative v, or we could think of it as we draw v extending from the tip of u, but in the opposite direction that v would point. So we can think of it as adding a negative v or just drawing v in the opposite direction. Either way, we end up here, and the composite vector still goes from the start of u to the end of v. So that composite vector would be the difference. That's vector subtraction. Here's a summary of vector addition and subtraction for three of the most common coordinate systems that we use in electromagnetics. And what we can see is it's all the same. We're just manipulating the different vector components. Now the more interesting topic of vector products. We start with the dot product. So the dot product takes two vector quantities, A and B, and it calculates a single scalar number. Now dot products are all about projections. How much of one vector lies in the direction of another? And in the next few minutes, we'll be discussing of how to calculate these projections. In practice, when we calculate dot products, we'll be multiplying the different vector components together and then adding them up. But one thing we need to realize is the answer we get is also this expression up here. It has both the magnitude of A and B, but then we have this cosine theta, where theta is the angle between them. And we tend to use this equation more to interpret what the dot product means, and the second equation we use to actually calculate the value of the dot product. And we can also use this first equation if we ever were asked, what's the angle between two vectors? Well, we can calculate the dot product using this second equation and then simply divide that by the magnitudes of A and B, take the inverse cosine, and we'll have the angle theta. Let's move on to projections. Here we would like to know the projection of A onto B. That is, how much of vector A lies in the direction of vector B. So what we would do is drop a projection down onto vector B from the tip of A so that this projection is at 90 degrees with respect to B. And now we'll know that this length here, that is at least the magnitude of the projection of A onto B and we calculate that easily with a dot product. It is a dot b, but what we've done here is we have a unit vector of b, so it's b divided by its magnitude, and that's because we're only interested in the direction of b here. The magnitude of b should not affect this projection at all. And remember when we first talked about unit vectors, 
we said that we tend to use unit vectors when we don't want the magnitude of a vector to pollute a calculation. And that's exactly it here. The magnitude of B does not affect this projection at all. So that means we would want to use the unit vector of B. So A dot unit vector of B gives the magnitude of this projection of A onto B. Well, that projection also has a direction. It is in the direction of B. So we need to multiply by direction. Again, we don't want the magnitude of B to pollute this direction. So we use a unit vector again, B divided by its magnitude. So we have the magnitude and the direction. And so that is the projection of A onto B. Now we can combine all this stuff and come up with a slightly simpler equation. And that's where we end up here. So it's A dot B. However, the magnitude of B, we don't want to pollute this calculation. So we divide by its magnitude. Then we multiply by B to get its direction and divide by its magnitude again. So if we hadn't stepped through that, it might be hard to look at this equation and see how that's doing a projection, but we're dividing by this magnitude B squared so that the magnitude of B does not pollute the calculation. And now we have the projection of A onto B. Let's do this projection the other way around. Let's project B onto A. How much of vector B lies in the direction of vector A? Well, the first thing we'll do is we'll calculate the magnitude. So we have to drop a projection down until it crosses the path of A so that the path of A and the projection are perpendicular to each other. And we know that the length from this intersection to the origin of the vectors, that length will be the magnitude of the projection. And so that's a dot product, B dot A, however, the magnitude of A should not affect this projection, only the direction of A. So really we're just using the unit vector in the A direction. So it's A divided by its magnitude. Well, now that projection of B also has a direction. It is in the direction of A, but once again, we don't want the magnitude of A to pollute that. So we need a unit vector A. So that's vector A, divided by its magnitude. So the projection has a magnitude and then a direction. And like before, we can combine all this into a single equation that if we just looked at this to start with, we may not quite understand what's going on here, but we're dividing by this magnitude A squared because we don't want the magnitude of A to pollute that calculation. So dot products are all about projections, but it's not exactly a projection because the magnitude of both A and B affect the dot product. We can use this as a test, and this is a very, very common way to test if two vectors are perpendicular. If two vectors A and B are perpendicular, their dot product is zero. This is so common, I've even heard people not even bother saying that two vectors are perpendicular. They literally just say dot product is zero. And it's used so much that we understand, oh, that means that they're perpendicular. So here's a quick example. If A and B are perpendicular to each other, we get a zero dot product. Any other time, we do not get zero. We don't know what we'll get. We'll have to do the math to figure that out, but it won't be zero if they're not perpendicular. Cross products. The cross product is another product of vectors. So we have A and B, those are two vectors, but the cross product is another vector. So that vector is conveying two pieces of information. And cross products are all about area and calculating directions that are perpendicular to both A and B. So what does that cross product mean? Well, we start off with our vectors A and B that I'm drawing as the the blue and red arrows here, and they'll have some angle between them. Well, those two vectors define a parallelogram. That's some area. And in fact, the magnitude part of the cross product is the area of that parallelogram. Now the direction of the cross product is in a direction perpendicular to this area here, this parallelogram. 
So the direction of the cross product ends up being perpendicular to both A and B. Now, A and B do not have to be perpendicular to each other, but the cross product will be perpendicular to both A and B. So we can write the cross product this way to sort of give it a little bit more uh, meaning to us, the cross product of A and B. Well, its magnitude is magnitude A times magnitude B times sine theta. So the angle definitely affects that. As the angle gets smaller, this area is getting smaller. So of course the overall cross product will be smaller. And then the direction is in a direction normal to that surface. And I'm just writing this as a unit vector with a subscript N, meaning the normal direction. The cross product has a handedness associated with it. So far, I've just said the direction of the cross product is perpendicular to that area. But if we think about that, there's actually two possible directions that could be perpendicular to that area. Well, it turns out a cross product has to follow the right hand rule. So here is somebody's right hand. Actually, that happens to be my right hand. And if you curl the fingers on your right hand in a way that would rotate vector A into vector B, then the thumb on your right hand is pointing in the direction of the cross product. Now, the other possible direction, had we not done this, might be straight downward, but that wouldn't follow the right hand rule. And it's important that our cross products follow the right hand rule or we'll get the signs in our problem wrong. So how do we calculate a cross product? This is a bit tedious and we will do this in Cartesian coordinates. So we have a vector A and B. The first thing we'll do is form an augmented matrix. We're not ever really going to use this as a matrix, but here would be a three by three matrix. In the top row, I have my unit vectors X, Y, and Z. In the second row, I have my X, Y, and Z components of the A vector. And in the third row, I have the X, Y, and Z components of the B vector. What I'll do now is take these first two columns and then copy them over to the outside. And this is our augmented matrix, if you will. But as I mentioned before, we're not actually going to use it as a matrix. It's more just an array of numbers. So here's our augmented matrix again. Now what we're going to do is multiply along all of the diagonals. So on the left-hand side, we have this first diagonal. So it's unit vector Z times AY times BX. And we end up with a first product. Our second diagonal unit vector A times AZ times BY. That's our second. And then we have unit vector Y, AX and BZ. And that's our third product. Then we can go the other diagonals, unit vector Z, A, X, B, Y. That's our first product on the right. Unit vector Y, A, Z, B, X. And that's our second product on the right. And then unit vector X, A, Y, B, Z. And our third product on the right. So we've come away with six products. What we'll do is we'll make all the ones on the left negative. So we've tacked on these negative signs here. And then all we do is we add it all up. And when we do that, that is our cross product. So if I'm forced to do a cross product by hand, this is how I'm doing it. I'm drawing this augmented matrix. I'm multiplying along the diagonals. I make all the diagonals on the left negative and then add everything together. Like the dot product, the cross product can be used as a test. We'll use this as a test to see if two vectors are parallel. If they're parallel, there's no area being defined. That parallelogram that would happen between A and B is perfectly zero because A and B are in the same direction. So this is a great test to see if vectors are parallel to each other. When they are, our cross product will be zero. And when they're not, the cross product will be not zero. And even if A and B are perpendicular, the cross product is not zero. When A and B are perpendicular, that's when the cross product will have its maximum magnitude because that's when the area of that parallelogram becomes the greatest. But the point is it's not zero. That cross product is only ever zero when A and B are parallel 
and the area of that parallelogram that they would define is zero. Here we're going to summarize the vector algebra rules. In the left column, when we have the rule, we'll have the rule for dot products, and on the right, we'll have the equivalent rule for cross products. First are the commutative laws. That means if we're calculating the product, can we reverse the order of A and B? And for dot products, absolutely, we get the same answer. For cross products, it's not quite the same. And in fact, we'd have to say that a cross product is not commutative. However, if we reverse the order of A and B, that is the same thing if reversing the order. If we tack on a negative sign here, and that has to do with the handedness. If we reverse the order of A and B, we've changed the handedness, and we have to put a negative sign in there to to compensate for that. But since that negative sign is here, we'd have to say, strictly speaking, that cross products are not commutative. However, we can do it if we remember to put in that negative sign. Associative laws. That means if we have a triple product, can we change the order in which we're multiplying things? Well, there really isn't a dot triple product. That doesn't exist. But we could talk about a triple product for cross products. And this is not associative. We're not free to change the order that we're calculating this triple cross product in. So uh, the cross product is not associative. On to distributive. That means if we have a product happening onto a sum, can we distribute these? And yes, that actually works for the dot product and the cross product, just how it would for standard algebra. Self product, what if we multiply it by itself? Well, a dot a is simply the magnitude of a squared. That's a pretty neat way of calculating the magnitude of a vector, a dot a, and then take the square root of that. Now, if we do a self product with the cross product, a cross a, that's always zero. And remember, we're, cross products are about areas. So what is the parallelogram defined by a and a? It's, it's zero because those two vectors are parallel. And in fact, we also had a test for testing if vectors are parallel. And certainly a vector is parallel with itself and the cross product ends up being zero. Last, we'll talk about vector triple products. And first we have a triple product that's a, a combination of a cross and a dot product. This is called the scalar triple product. And it's called the scalar triple product because first we'll calculate a cross product. That gives us another vector, but then a vector dot product with another vector gives us a scalar. So the scalar triple product has three vectors, but we calculate a single scalar number. Now, what does that scalar number mean? Well, A, B, and C define what's called a parallel pipe bed, kind of a cube rectangular thing here, but it can be oblique. These A, B, and C don't have to be 90 degrees with respect to each other. That scalar triple product is the volume of this parallel pipe bed. So what a neat way to calculate the volume of some oblique shape. Otherwise, we're forced to have to do some geometry here to figure out what the volume of that would be. Another triple product that we have is the vector triple product. And that is when we have two cross products happening at the same time. And it turns out we can write this as two dot products. And sometimes this is called the back cab rule for vectors. And we will use this when we start deriving the wave equation. We'll first have a, a triple cross product and we will then convert it to two dot products and then do some additional stuff from there. So those are the two vector triple products that we can have. We'll have a scalar triple product that has a scalar answer. That's the volume of a parallel pipet. Then the vector triple product, and that'll arise when we derive the wave equation.